associate professor at Cooper University in Australia, where he currently serves as the deputy head of School of Design in the Built Environment. Before joining Cooper University in 2015, uh, Professor Mancini has taught at University of Roma at Pratt Institute, at the Waterloo University, Iowa State University, and also with the internationally renowned architect Peter Eisenman at the Cooper Union School of Architecture in New York. Francesco is an architectural theorist interested in architectural language, design thinking, and the role of urban morphology in shaping the civic real. He holds a PhD on, on Peter Eisenman's work from the University of Florence. So. Uh, welcome, Francesco, and now I can um, leave it to you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, as Alessandro mentioned, I'm currently the Deputy Head of School of the School of Built Environment at Curtin University in Australia. I moved to Australia five years ago, and my background as a trained architect and educator is in Italy, mainly. And I guess that it is important for me to mention this today because uh, uh, my lecture uh, is on the city of Perth and we will approach this uh, having a look at uh, a number of factors that have influenced its uh, recent uh, development. Um, but I, uh, it is very important for me to, to give you a bit of a background about my uh, training in architecture and the fact that I'm coming from a typological and morphological school of thought that is very present in Italy. Um, you, you know Alessandro, so probably you have a pretty good understanding of what that means. Um, and this caused me a little bit of distress and displacement when uh, I started uh, living, working and, and teaching here in, in a city that doesn't, doesn't share the same cultural background at all, not just for geographical reasons, but mainly because it's a very recent um, settlement that was founded in 1829 only. So coming from a background where history and stratification and layering um, uh, were very useful and gave me a lot of insight about the understanding, the reading of the city. I think this seminar is called Writing um, the Form of the City, but in order to be able to write, you need to be able to read first. So my, my first challenge was effectively how to find a way to read a different, a very different city from the cities I'm used to, you know. Uh, it doesn't look like Berlin or Rome or Vienna. It is closer perhaps to Los Angeles, um, as you can see from this, from this first image. Um, a very nice place to be, uh, but with a number of, of, of problems from the urban perspective point of view that probably come uh, I can can be understood looking back at its recent history and its formation. Uh, so uh, this lecture is focusing on the cultural capital of urban morphology. Um, in a way, it is an attempt to um, to bridge the gap between what what has happened in understanding the process of uh, making uh, of cities um, before and after. The, uh, the 19th and 20th century when huge technological revolution occurred and the way we have approached planning and executing the making of the city has um, notably changed uh, also because we moved to a totally different uh, model, urban model, you know, from the walking city to the car based city. So this is a bit of a background. And uh, together with my colleague, who's, who's was so kind to join me today, Tanya Gusek, um, from Curtin uh, as well. Um, she and I have started studying this problem, trying to connect the necessity of uh, cultural understanding of these processes together with um, a reflection on how to move forward and how to interpret the uh, uh, contemporary urban phenomena in light of theories that refer to the city of the past, but which for us still maintain a, a, a fundamental value, which is the set of values that makes a city a place, a place to live. Um, so starting from here, Perth um, is being changed in uh, its urban fabric and appearance from a colonial outpost. It was, it was founded as a rural colony, as I said, in 1829. Um, in a post-colonial center, which has embraced modernity, in particular starting in the 50s. So 
in its uh, brief history, uh, he probably uh, even in the eyes of the of the of the planners and the governors of the of, of the sixties and the seventies in particular, uh, its brief history has been uh, considered perhaps missing or of not enough strong in value to be considered while uh, deciding how the, the city should have um, evolved and grown. So uh, what happened is that what prevailed was it the strong ideological uh, perspective brought by the modernist approach that started from the tabula rasa approach, uh, which considers that the city can be constantly erased and rewritten, but from zero, uh, as if um, uh, the erasure, that is the demolition of the previous urban fabric, could be a good excuse not to consider the past phenomena that actually have um, determine the actual and the present uh, shape of the city uh, today. So this paradigm, of course, has been heavily supported by global and economic forces, and we do not deny that global and economic forces are part of the forces which, which shape the city. But essentially, the cultural value of the, of the form of the city itself and the, its ability to embed particular way of, uh, of living together has been somehow denied. And of course, Perth is not the only example. Many colonial cities in North America, to say the least, um, have followed the same, the same pathway. Um, perhaps the Perth scenario is even more interesting due to its particular uh, climate condition and also due to the fact this is not something we will touch upon much during this lecture, but there is another history here that has been neglected for, for, for more than 100 years, and it's the history of the indigenous people who uh, used to uh, inhabit and, and be custodian of these lands um, before the colonial setting started. Um, so the idea is to uh, somehow identify what we can transfer from different in, in previous way of thinking of the city and looking at the city of the past to uh, change uh, our mindset when we look at the city of the present to shape its future. Um, we have used, Tanya and I, in this particular presentation, this particular work, a model proposed by Bourdieu about the value of, of cultural capital. So we will touch upon briefly on that too arguing that you know the um if economic value and, and 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 social value are definitely something that everyone can acknowledge the cultural capital is something that is embedded also in the city as an artifact it's not just something that is purely immaterial and in staying with us now this is a concept that is uh very uh, uh, immediate to to understand uh when you refer to heritage but we argue that there is a cultural capital in the form of the city as a whole that needs to be considered as a point of reference even in the uh most punctual intervention and there are a number of theories who have reflected and acted uh, upon this uh, particularly over the 60s the 70s and the 80s when the crisis of modernism and modernist values started to to show their cracks and their crinkles um, you can see here that we have referred also to uh, Leonardo Benevolo and Aldo Rossi in particular with his, his idea of permanence in time of the form. And we have tried to um, understand uh, if this concept was applicable and transferable to the city of Perth. In these images that you're seeing, you're looking at the city of Perth and its evolution uh, over the past 100, uh, 200 years, uh, sorry, 100 years. Um, the great growth that uh, has brought an incredible dispersal to sprawling um, that happened essentially between the 70s and the early 2000s, um, which has uh, enlarged the, the settlement from a small um, a concentrated uh, development around the main river of the city, the Swan River, um, and, the, and the Cunningham River. Uh, in um, through a, a huge region that is 150 kilometers long and 35 kilometers wide. So this phenomenon also presents a problem from the sustainability perspective. It's impossible to conceive that the city of Perth can can go ahead with this with this type of of development. So the the 19th century revolution, which started shifting the paradigm of urban of urban um, growth. 
uh, needs now to be seriously put in question. And it's not through uh, a return to the past that we try to argue this, but we try to see what is a good balance um, between the tools offered by present technology in terms of transportation, in terms of, in terms of building, um, and, and, and those set of values that probably have gone lost uh, through over, over the past 50 years, certainly, certainly impaired. Um, the, this lack of knowledge uh, in application of transverse values principles, which is present in the form of pre-industrial cities, constitutes a knowledge gap for us, uh, meaning that not much attention has been uh, given to the fact that previous years of the city, uh, looking at historic cities, uh, do not seem to fight or to offer too many tools for contemporary development uh, of the city. So that's where our research um, is placed at the moment. So moving forward, um, just to give you a better sense of what that means in practice, you know, the historic nucleus that normally uh, was the one uh, that was shaping the, the what we call them uh, today as historic centers of industrial cities became uh, more and more l less effective in shaping the whole identity of the city because more nucleus started to emerge and after the sprawl of polycentric cities started to emerge and the network city started to to take shape and so the center of gravity of the city center um has lost somehow importance uh with a, 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 a an evolution of the city fabric based on low densities and of on and mainly on a monofunctional, uh, driven by monofunctional planning. But what does it mean in terms of form, in terms of morphology? Uh, well, I think that uh, this diagram presented by um, Colin Rowe and um, and uh, um, and and Fred Kutter in their book uh, Collage City, um, which is from 1972, is quite is quite explicit. The value of a city fabric as a, a stratified sets of elements which went through a number of typological transformation has been totally denied by an approach that is shaping the city to court in a single act, compressing time and space, and uh, reverse essentially in terms of role, in terms of weighting, in terms of percentages, the relationship between the footprint of the buildings and the urban space. This was coming with a vision of a city that was a city of freedom and a city of control of its uh, of its urban areas uh, dedicated to different functions, live, work, and play, um, where uh, the uh, the main arteria of traffic were actually setting the scene for the urban planning to come, rather than um, the opposite way around, where the buildings themselves were main responsible of shaping in uh, in continuity um, the urban the urban space, the form of the of the urban space, the form of the void space. Um, I think that this is one of the main uh, point of reflection uh, for us today, that there's this lack of continuity and cohesiveness between the solid and the void space in the contemporary city um, is uh, the manifestation of loss of that sense of wholeness and also social continuity uh, and uh, and, um, and permeability um, that actually gives so much value to the city centers that we all love, the historic city centers that we all love. As I said before, it's not a way uh, to return to, to the past, but certainly the subversion of land use in favor of large and linear transport infrastructure has led to an increase in urban dispersion. So the suburbs are now very sparse, low footprint, all the, all the, all the issues that I mentioned before. Um, while the central business districts, like the, the one that the city of Perth you're looking at now, is incredibly condensating um, um, the excess, perhaps, not, as, not necessarily a bad thing per se, of, of built mass, and uh, which is in turn attracting a flow of traffic which is among us every day just to come to the city center. The flow of traffic that is the, uh, mainly delivered through private transportation, um, which is uh, impacting further, uh, not only on the arterias of, of traffic, but also is generating um, many problems in, in, in parkings and in areas that needs to be dedicated to non-human activities in this regard. So all of this strategy 
presented by the modernist city, which we call also the Fordist city. Uh, it's not the case that we refer to Fordist city. So the city based on Harry Ford, Harry Ford's vision of the city uh, governed through automobile and, and, and private traffic, has determined an entire form, uh, urban form, that is now questioned in, in many in many respects. So you attempted to build the image of a city that is uh, reflecting this idea of success and progress and is attracting people to business, uh, but as a matter of fact, um, such a planning and, and, and governance approach has produced a city that has an incredible huge backyard where everything is uh, left to sort of uncontrolled or at least a non-cohesive uh, development where the, the mix of functions is actually absolutely um, purely functional, but it is uh, an intricacy. Uh, it's a piecemeal, essentially. It's an intricacy of fragmented parts which do not talk to each other. So the railway doesn't talk to the city, which doesn't talk to the parks, which doesn't talk to the heritage precinct. While in the outskirts of the city, um, the city is this one. So the city of Perth does not exist anymore. It's totally dissolved in this huge um, um, area, vast uh, lands of new developments where the Australian dream is still cultivated. So uh, where the large majority of people today still lives in single detached houses. The density of Perth the, um, is about uh, six to eight inhabitants per hectare as an average, which is one of the lowest in the world. Uh, and now a, a, a great process of uh, of, uh, of uh, densification has been set in place, but it's a very slow process. And one of the reasons for this is that uh, the model of inhabitation based on single detached houses, basically mainly brought from the United Kingdom, from uh, you know um, the, the, the Arcadian vision that the United Kingdom was proposing at the turn of the century still, um, has not uh, grown into, into, into a different model, also because of, uh, of lack of a long history in terms of typological um, settlements and transformation. Not to mention the fact that uh, we have moved from single um, detached house to high rise, especially to respond to a particular demand that is coming basically from Asian markets. So even in that, in that effort, I think that the, the cultural value of what does it mean to inhabit in a particular way using a particular form and typological model has not been yet um, considered in, in, in depth uh, when it comes to the Australian cities and, and to Perth in, in this particular case. Um, this is where we will concentrate our attention uh, today. Um, so the city centre and what has been happening over the 10, 15 uh, years. Um, the the um, development of the city has changed radically starting 1994 when the city started to realize that uh, um, the modernist approach to core was not serving the purpose of, of creating a city which could compete in many ways in many respects um, on the global scene. Uh, here I have outlined um, the major elements that actually have separated and isolated the city center that you see here in, this, in, 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 the, in the core part of, the, um, of this slide, uh, contained between the south side is, oh, sorry, um, I just slammed. Uh, the south side uh, um, of, of the city, which is facing the Swan River, um, has been uh, separated by the river because it is true that all of the uh, orange area that you see is actually reclaimed land that has been um, filled in order to gain land and has reduced the, the, the water basin of the river itself. Um, but actually this huge area has not been then used to establish a new relationship with the river. On the north side, the railway that was established when the gold rush um, actually um, brought a lot of um, additional traffic in, uh, and, and commerce to the city um, has been um, developed in such a way to isolate the city center from the, from the northern development, while 
On the east and on the west side, in light blue, you can see the two highways literally cut, chop the city uh, off from the rest from the rest of uh, of uh, of the city center. So East Perth and West Perth has been somehow divided uh, by um, the the Kiwinana Freeway, which is um, this one here for, that runs from north south. So these are the major infrastructural elements that have um, probably uh, served the city uh, in some sense, but also have denied the opportunity for the for the city to develop as a whole. And uh, on, on, on the left of the Kiwinana freeway, freeway, you see the Kings Park, which is one of the most important parks and botanic gardens of the whole of the whole area. Um, on, on the other side of the river, where the stadium has been built recently, uh, this was a totally uh, wasted land, uh, was uh, used as a, as a dump, essentially. It had to be clean altogether because the environmental cleaning was uh, uh, was necessary there this is a product is a by is a byproduct of the of the industrial city at its best where the functionality of the production and the product the product the production of of, of financial value of, of what we what we understand as value has been definitely um, prevailing over the production of cultural value in terms of city for uh, so in 1994, the city has invited young Gale architects to start having a look at what was happening, particularly in the city center, because they started realizing that the city center was empty, was not vibrant, as, as they used to refer to places that actually are quite successful in Australia and, and the world, and start looking at why certain things were not working. And all of a sudden, we start to see that the elements that actually prevent this part of the city from being a successful place are all the elements that characterize the form and, and the buildings of the traditional city, which is active street streetways, um, which is uh, a mix of use that is uh, including inhabitants and dwellers, not just uh, office buildings in the city center, pedestrian connectivity, a porosity at the ground floor level. All of these elements could be embraced by contemporary city forms if just they were looking at the past uh, of traditional cities, not with the intent to replicate their the shape, but actually understand the value of that particular form. Um, I will skip this part. I will just fly over this slide just to let you know that we are trying to look at back in terms of framework of the theory of Kanijo and Maffei, where I come from, school of typological uh, process, um, who actually have explained very, very clearly how through history the building type has evolved uh, from a, a, a slow process of refinement and transformation, which was not based merely on urban substitution, but it was actually a process of transformation. Now, um, this process has basically uh, been stopped by a, a huge technological change. So we build differently today and we do no longer build to last. This is also a, a mindset approach. Um, but the, the interesting part that we have found is that when we talk about substitution versus transformation or the two integrated to each other, we realize that transformation in the past was um, um uh, much more reliant, much more present in in moments where there was a continuity in history while in moments of crisis the, the process of substitution and erasure has taken place well it appears that today our cities face uh, a continuum moment of crisis in um preserving buildings just pre for preserving buildings per se is not is not is not an argument in my view but certainly looking at how we can build upon what we have is uh, an essential point of view. Um, so I will just touch upon a few points that have been mentioned by a number of theorists in this regard. Number one, the spontaneous consciousness. I think that this is a crucial point. The city of the past were not just made uh, through huge buildings like you see here, the amphitheater and Roman cities, where they were also the product of a collective, um, people who literally participated in, in building the city and they were basically acting uh, by incremental stages, but they were equally responsible for the construction of the city as well as the big architects or the big projects that were held um, by, by the governments and, and the emperors of the time. Here we see examples 
of the of the uh, of the Roman city that then in the Middle Age, and this is probably the period that outlights um, this process better than any other. Alessandro is an expert, so feel free to interrupt me and say uh, whatever I'm saying incorrect. But uh, in, even in moments of, of, of uh, you know, of, uh, of needs, you know, when the means and, 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 the, and the economy were not that strong, that's a moment when this type of reuse becomes really prevailing and structures most of the urban fabric of historic centers that, as we know them today. Now, these alternation, um, these alternating process of substitution, constructions of new buildings, large monuments versus moments in which the, the, the fabric consolidates uh, in the process of making the city is what has determined a particular layer in historic cities. But it is also, according to our thesis, what has helped preserving, what has helped uh, building a, a, a set of uh, values that were intimately related to the values of the people who inhabited the city. So it was a huge participative, participatory process through this, what um, Nafai and Kanija have defined as spontaneous consciousness. Um, today, there are different forms of participation that can actually help us to balance the plan and execute approach to reestablish a closer contact through the shape of our city with the people who live in there. But first of all, it's important to read back the city and, and understand the certain choices that have been made in regard to what the past has produced probably should be reconsidered. This is a clear example of how the past has been treated. And, and I'm not referring to the past uh, just as, as heritage or potential heritage. I'm referring to the product of previous uh, actions on a particular uh, urban place that had some sort of value, not because they were necessarily high piece of heritage, but just because they were embedding uh, uh, you know, what life was there. Even though this was just a colonial outpost, and even though this building is referring, you're looking at the barracks, uh, the uh, actually the, uh, the pension of barracks, um, of, of the garrison who used to be here um, during the times in which Perth uh, was a penal colony. Penal, uh, Perth was a penal colony for about 20, 30 years. Um, the, um, the, the building has been uh, tore down in the early 70s, probably with not much negotiation or consultation, um, just to build uh, the Kiwidana freeway, the, one, the, the, the freeway that separates the, uh, the city center of Perth from West Perth, and which runs just in front of the, of the, of the government palace here um, that you see uh, in the lower right image. So this small yellow ring that you see in the lower right image is what's left uh, of the original building that you see on the lower, on the lower, um, oh, sorry, uh, the, the yellow ring is on the lower right, the, in the, the building is on the, the original building is on the lower left of this image. And what's being left is what looks like a, a triumphal arch, which has nothing to do with the typology of the building that it represents. Furthermore, it's not even really reachable because it's totally separated by traffic lane went, uh, so it's really sitting in a triangle of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere. It's just acting as an image, as a sort of visual landmark, but it's not really a landmark because uh, it's, not, it's not addressing any goal. So if you go back to, uh, for instance, what uh, Kevin Lynch um, has, has discussed with his theory of cognitive mappings in the, um, in the image of the city, the relationship between the image and the form of the city should always make uh, make a strong connection. So when Lynch calls, uh, talks about nodes or edges or pathways, districts and landmarks, he clearly has demonstrated that through people's experience is possible to establish a strong relationship between where uh, artifacts are located and what do they mean really for, for the city. Um, we discuss about the um, spontaneous consciousness. The counterpart of the spontaneous consciousness in Canadian's Maffei theory is the critical consciousness, which has been very often identified with the ability, uh, well, the ability to produce architectures by means of a conscious act, which is, in fact, design. Um, so uh, there is this component that has been growing over and over, um, has been institutionalized 
it was institutionalized to an extent also in the antiquity has been institutionalized mainly uh, during Renaissance um, when the figure of the architect emerged as a, as a, 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 a catalytic probably uh, character. So a, a person was able not only to conceive and design, but was, always, was also in charge of the construction um, and so had full control on the building process and uh, everyone was working for to fulfill that particular design that has been approved by a particular client um this probably has left out the opportunity for a different set of participation and probably this thing for the new form of the, the next form of city to be uh, even important that we can see a pro is going to take place. And so imagine the participatory process is a way to introduce the component of the design approach is of ideal space should look like um, in the city. But effectively, um, emphasis on design as an what the historic certificates is for us, itself. This beautiful land just to all these beautiful experiences. Oh, Captain, if you could please do now, I can try to quickly. Oh, signal is good. Okay, you have many problems with this. Um, Alessandro, you might my... you can't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, we are experiencing problem with the quality of the audio. So maybe yeah. it will st stabilize in a few seconds, but to this point, we cannot hear you. Okay. Uh, no, I cannot hear you. Okay. It, um, probably, you know, sometimes the Wi Fi signal goes down, not completely, but, you know, partially at least. So that might be the case. Yeah. And usually, I mean, in my personal experience, you know, like this is not. Um, after a few minutes it go comes back so i'm not I'm, i don't know what to say there's nothing we can do about it except you know waiting a second and starting off continuing you want to try uh, co continue talking so we understand if it's it's better yes i do understand it she's going to go off at the no, it's it's not working. No, no, it's still. Does your computer tell you that there's low connectivity or anything like this? Um, no, I didn't get any. So I can double check, but. Uh, uh, now it seems to be better. Keep okay. talking. All right, I will. Um, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. It's not. It's still pretty bad. Con low connectivity could be in Turkey as well, uh, so not necessarily it is from you know on your side. But the only thing we can do is wait, you know, and and but there's nothing else we can do than wait. Yes. yes. So from time to time, I'm trying to talk again, and you hear me, Alessandro. You hear me? I do hear you. It's a little bit better, but not as we would expect. Okay. Uh, keep talking anyhow, you know, yes. just okay. go round and round <laughs> until, <laughs> because uh, there's nothing we can do about it, I, I mean. Yeah. Uh, wait a second. Okay. Can you hear me, Otsuke? Can you hear my voice? Uh, in, is my wo voice interrupted as the one from Francesco is? Not as much as the prof uh, Professor Mancini. I can hear you, but Professor Mancini's sound is coming and stopping, coming, stopping. Mm, so it's probably a connectivity problem on their side, on that side of the world, but there's nothing we can do about it. So we well, will have to uh, continue and, you know, maybe want to talk slowly. That might help. 
Okay, I I can try. If you can just bear with me a few seconds, I can check my no. connection, which is no, 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 no. It's very good. No, it's, it's, very it's, good. it's working. Oh, no, it's, it's working. working. Okay, so, uh, it, you know, okay, fantastic. But sorry for that. You know, there's something. Now I have lost you. <laughs> so I. I Sorry, I muted okay. myself. I oh, muted okay. myself. Yes, I saw, okay, I saw the mic. I mute myself so that no noise comes out of my microphone. And right. so please keep going. I, I beg your yes. pardon. There's nothing we can do about these technical okay. issues. Uh, okay, I would go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Now we'll keep the chat on every time so I know that uh, when that happens. Um, so I just mentioned briefly that the approach that they had in, in dealing with heritage and in, in how to integrate the, the past and in the present in, in the future developments of the city in Perth has been quite problematic, and particularly in the 70s. Um, and not just because of the low value given to particular pieces of heritage, but was the lack of integration between uh, pre-existing buildings and what do they represent and how they have been seen and transform uh, in this regard when not totally uh, demolished. Um, on the other side, we have discussed after the uh, having um, after discussing what is the um, the spontaneous consciousness that in the past has contributed to generate the city, the critical consciousness, which we have identified uh, as a design um, approach, a heavily controlled design approach that ended up by being based on aesthetic values most of times. Um, aesthetic values once again detach for, from those values generated by a different process of CD making. Um, and it is with this in mind that then we have approached the Pierre Bourdieu um, theory of, um, of uh, cultural capital, trying to identify how the the cultural capital, which is different from the social capital, is really the cultural capital of artifacts, which in our view embodies not only the financial capital, but also the social capital of the city, um, can be, uh, can be, um, um, can be, um, can be, um, how can I say, um, integrated further. Um, the um, the the concept that Bourdieu is um, is proposing is that the there is an institutionalized state, but there is also an embodied state that is a a long lasting disposition of mind and body, which we argue is what we should recover. Looking looking back at how this was embodied in the artifacts of the historic city, um, the. The cultural capital uh, has been embraced at a high level through, you know, the grand tours in Europe and 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 through and through um, different initiatives that you know who could afford traveling, who could afford visiting, um, uh, could effectively absorb um, uh, developing a culture of place and, and a culture of design that has that has been proposed um, further. But uh, clearly there is a need to um, reflect on how the, 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 local, uh, the local inhabitants uh, can contribute again to this process of making uh, without you know, forgetting that we live in a totally different and complex world. Now, this operation has been embraced in a number of projects that have been recently developed by the city of Perth after the 2004. Uh, Young Hale was back in 2009 also to see how certain initiatives, which were mainly regarding uh, placemaking um, um, and, and work on, on, on the uh, revitalization of streets pathways had been taken by the city of Perth while starting uh, 2010, 2012, a number of major projects driven by the state, the city, um, at various levels, have been uh, set in place with the idea to, with the idea of of, of um, uh, bringing the, the at least the city center on the next level. So this was also complemented by 
the beginning of a strategy for densification and in field in the outskirts and the suburbs. Um, and, uh, and also with an approach to a more sustainable design logic um, uh, to core. These are the first attempts, um, and this is where we have focused our case studies. I will go very quickly uh, through them um, just to um, try to demonstrate that, again, this is a learning process. So the first attempts probably were not fully uh, capturing the essence of what was missing. Um, and in particular, I would say that the Perth Convention Center, which you see in the lower part, of this um, image was still conceived of as an object, a modernist object that was there to create a sense of place and attract lots of uh, participants to all conventions and other, and other events, but was not really thought of being um, in continuity with the city. So it created more edges rather than district or, or uh, continuous areas. It was also uh, the, the area in which the building was, was decided to be built was also a very problematic one, totally surrounded by um, all the, all, all the drive-throughs of, of, of the Kiwinana uh, highways. So it was a first experiment to bring uh, a large-scale project to the city of Perth um, with the idea uh, of uh, looking at uh, um, a, a more cohesive uh, integration of, of activities in the city. The other one uh, is the Perth Arena. Again, uh, the Perth Arena is, is a block uh, that is a sort of freestanding object. But then a few others, the Western Australian Museum, 140 William Street, the Treasury Building in particular, will focus on our attention uh, on that one, uh, actually proved to be um engaging in terms of shape and form and spaces um uh, rather than just being objects um, located um, in the city so a where the city center sits is where the city was founded uh i'm just uh going taking a step back just to give you um a quick snapshot uh of the of the history of the city, also to um, reflect on one on one thing, it, it, the the colonial outposts in many areas of the world, South America, North America, and Australia, um, were set in such a way where the relationship between street patterns and and city blocks, uh, the ratio between these two was quite different from original European cities. Um, so in a way, they were almost prepared to grow. There was this anticipation of what growth could be um, that effectively was embraced by the city form. And this prepared for uh, the further process of development where small uh, plots of land started to be uh, merged together, in particular when the city started to expand and the value of these areas, very central, became, became huge. Um, and, and then the city, of course, developed in height. So the first point that we want to uh, acknowledge is that the verticalization of the city is in some form connected to its previous um, development. At least the colonial cities seeded um, these opportunities since the beginning, uh, even though there were no technological means, particularly in the 1700s or in the 1600s, to build more than um, easily more than four or five story high building. But uh, at the moment, the, the high-rise the high technology allowed this to happen. In particular, colonial cities were ready to go. But then um, uh, in the 50s and in the 60s, we have seen how the infrastructural component has taken over uh, the attention to, to, for the city fabric. And that's where, uh, with that logic, uh, many of these, uh, well, a number of these uh, huge buildings uh, for urban services have been conceived uh, as infrastructural objects rather than part of the city itself. So you see that the, the grid here, the original grid of the city is somehow denied or not extended. Um, in a way, this is a totally artificial operation. The land on which this building sits, the Perth Convention um, Center is artificial land as well. It's totally reclaimed land, uh, which was mainly built to allow this disaster of highways that uh, intersect each other. Uh, each other. 
Uh, equally, uh, the bay that is on, on the right side, the Bay of Elizabeth Key, that you see on the right side of this figure, is, um, is in a totally artificial operation that has been carved out uh, to reconquer, trying to reconquer a, a stronger relationship between the river and the city. So what you see is that the basic main um, uh, morphological elements, not only uh, of the city fabric, but also of the geography of the place uh, and the way it has been interpreted over time, uh, are absolutely neglected by this approach. That, and, and it is essential to reflect on these and act differently because all of these operations prove to be uh, not as successful if you have to dig what we claim back just 20, 30 years ago uh, to try to recover um, a renovated relationship between natural features uh, and, and, and the artificial uh, man-made um, form of the city in a more uh, integrated, I, I would say, ecological <clears throat> relationship. So I will not um, <clears throat> focus on this too much. <clears throat> there are many examples that I want to just quickly show you, but this is more to um, um, start a debate, perhaps, about uh, where we should go, where we're going. Um, this is showing you the, the convention center from, um, the, uh, from the Kiwinana Freeway. And you can see that, you know, the only relationship you have with the building is really the, you know, the, the sign that you see that, that, that gives you the, the exit, the drive exit to the parking area. There's no sense of continuity that is, uh, you know, making your experience a continuous fluid experience throughout the city that allows you to understand how it operates. Similar, re similar uh, outcome for the Perth Arena, um, now Rack Arena, uh, which is a very successful building in terms of uh, its functioning. Uh, financially, it's very viable. And it's proved to be successful. But from an urban perspective, uh, the form and the approach that integration between the form of the building and, and the space that is surrounding it is not being uh, thought um, thoughtfully. And probably this is uh, why now the city of Perth is thinking of, of sinking uh, the, whole, uh, the whole railway to reconnect, in particular, the north and the south side of the city center. So, even when the city looks like a much more uh, integrated and continuous, like here in the, this is the, the blue rectangle that we were looking at when we were looking at the, at the, at the main maps of the city of Perth. If we look carefully, uh, you know, it's not just a matter of identifying the highway as the bad guy. This lack of continuity and this overpresence of the critical consciousness in terms of hyper-designed space is also very present in the green space and in historic precincts because heritage has been seen for decades, the, the major heritage buildings of the city have been seen as something that had to be fully preserved. They're still in use, um, like the, the, the tribunal and the, the, governor, the, the governor palace uh, in, this, in this picture. But as a matter of fact, they're heavily uh, isolated through a huge precinct uh, that is meant to protect them, if you like. And apart from the um, from the <clears throat> council house, that is this modernistic building that has been plugged in here, um, there is no strong relationship. And even though these are green areas and they are, they are parks, there are not many people actually take advantage of it. Um, again, there is no sense of permeability and continuity between the city fabric and these areas um, pervades a sense of uh, identity related to exclusion rather than connection, if if I may say so. Coming to this to the precinct that is 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 here in orange, uh, we focus our attention on these case studies, um, looking at what happened um, in this particular uh, precinct. This is one of the most historic areas, the the center of the city. The Cardis and the Decumanos are just right here on the lower on the lower uh, left corner of this of this block and this is where um, the main church was built in the 60s i will just uh, flick through the, the historic evolution of the buildings but uh, this is an area where you can actually see that even in uh, over the span of uh, uh, 160 years um, there's been a process of substitution uh, addition and and then uh, 
partial demolition. Um, but uh, what is interesting is that here, probably for the very first time uh, in, in dealing with historic historic uh, objects um, that were uh, placed at the very center uh, of the city, which really uh, mean uh, um, much in terms of recognizability of the um, colonial outpost that was there. This was the center, the number 11, is the is the is today is the treasury building uh used to be uh the the government building where the governor used to be um the number 15 is the is the uh, cathedral of perth um so when in the 60s and in the 70s was proposed to um reshuffle uh, this precinct to uh, accommodate um the state tribunal and other public buildings of um of the city of Perth, um, there was a huge debate about uh, placing a huge tower, a uh, very, very different kind of form, an artifact into in, in this area. Uh, this debate has been lasting for about 20, 25 years. <clears throat> but at the end, um, as I mentioned before, the, the notion that uh, the evolution of the city um, uh, vertically uh, is being accepted as part of the transformation of the city itself through a uh, well the the process of, ne of negotiation and consultation was not totally extended but probably was the first time in which uh, one of the first time in which there was a huge uh, public debate about how to go about this which uh, ended up as a process in the construction of these three buildings by Kerry Hill architects who had integrated or try the best to integrate through modernist forms and shapes if you like the new forms added as a parasitic as an independent object as object inserted into other objects on the left um, and integrate the form of the existing with the form of the new and at the same time find trying to find a new consistency for an area that was uh, rich in terms of heritage but was not was a little bit neglected uh, as, a, as a public space. So it's, I found this example very interesting because uh, typical modernist typologies like the tower, the cylindric object, or you know the free shape, very Corbusian um, addition to the building number 26 that you see here, have been used with a, with a different kind of, of mindset and approach. Um, and even if the results might be surprising and could be even argued, if you like, um, there is a sense of, uh, there is an intention to echo um, the past in the present and to merge these two realities uh, into one um, to establish that sort of continuity that is certainly non stylistic and is not historically uh, um, driven, but is a sort of, uh, you know, cultural continuity in terms of culture of the city, in terms of um, sharing the same place, the old and the new together um, in, a, in a contemporary fashion. Last but not least, you know, the, the tower eventually got there. Um, but in my view, and I'm definitely open for discussion, I think that all in all, this operation proved to be quite successful. In particular, because um, the form of, this, of the space of the city, you remember that we discussed at the beginning, the Nolly map of uh, the city of uh, Padova, of Parma, next to Corbusian's scheme for his contemporary city. Uh, the idea to maintain a permeability between the old and the new buildings and going through and use the, the ground floor space, I can go back here to this image in particular, um, to use the ground floor space as a very permeable um, arena for, for urban and social exchange was maintained. And I think that maybe the, the project in the end is not as successful as it might have been in this regard, but I think it's a good, it's a good attempt to synthesize uh, an integrated relationship between contemporary form and past form. So this proves to me, uh, as a case study, that it is possible to transfer these, these values in the contemporary city. And uh, uh, the formal outcome might be the most diverse. This is, I show you just very quickly another example. This is um, uh, Yagan Square, that is, uh, which is a, a square that has been um, identified and, and built where the horse show bridge that was connecting Istanbul 
connecting this bridge here. Um, the the north the northern um, north bridge um, area of the city with Perth. Um, in the in the um, in the shape of the bridge, uh, a new square has been built also to reconcile uh, cultural values coming from indigenous culture with the uh, contemporary Western culture that is presently dominating the image of the city of Perth. And in doing this, uh, in multiple layers of, uh, of history and cultural diversities have been, have been considered uh, with a formal outcome, uh, which is very, very, different from the one that we have seen um, with an attempt to int introduce landscape elements, even, through, even though through an artificial reconstruction, uh, as a sense of memory of what this place was when the chief Yagan used to be um, um, leading his group in this, in this area. So uh, there is an attempt to, to shape the city uh, using the cultural value of particular events, even those who are quite maybe uncomfortable still to discuss in, in Western Australia. So this is my conclusion. Uh, the, the, the description of historic typological transformation of a prison, to me, to us, shows that the typological transformation can address and explain complex phenomena and not just urban substitution. It's something that we must consider um, wherever we have the chance. And sometimes, you know, the transformation, even if uh, buildings have been torn down and apparently there's no memory of them, in my view, erasure is always an act of further writing, is never the erasure of what was before. Those, those previous realities do never, never totally disappear. So it's an illusion to imagine that we have a perfect tabula rasa all the time. Um, we have found uh, um, solidarity, saying, in a number of theorists um, who have um, thoughts for this. Probably the most prominent who has come to a conclusion with an urban theory is Christopher Alexander, um, who has run a number of studios to test his ideas about the concept of urban wholeness. And uh, today, for me, he's probably one of the most successful who has uh, tried to transfer uh, values of pre-industrial cities into contemporary city uh, without necessarily falling back into the pastiche or postmodern approach as maybe other authors have been tempted to do. Um, in my view, Colin Rowe, Rob Creer, the Creer brothers and others have done an incredible work and they are absolutely outstanding for their work, but uh, perhaps from this perspective, um, they took a different direction. So uh, it's not just a, a battle between substitution of buildings and, and historical transformation. It, it is really an acknowledgement that all cities rely on strata. And probably our next step is to uh, engage further with the geographic strata and the, the cultural strata of Perth and its region, of the Wajak region of the indigenous people, to see how all of these elements factor in, in, in shaping, in shaping um, the uh, the contemporary form of the city. And the opportunity is given from by the new Western Australian Museum that is currently under construction. And it is with these images of a city that is apparently, uh, you know, overheading the ancient or the, or the cultural hegemony of, of, of the, uh, of the um, uh, colonial settings. Uh, but in that gallery that you see over the top, suspended over the top of the previous museum, uh, there is the space for um, the Encounter of Cultures uh, exhibition for the indigenous culture to be exhibited. Uh, perhaps it's a dialogue that will, will go for a while, but um, it is something upon, upon which uh, we want to reflect and maybe start from a new point zero um, in, a few, in a few years. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Francesco, for your very interesting uh, lecture. And um, I took a few notes about what what Kanija refers to as the medievalization. So that transformation that occurs in the Middle Ages to the yes. uh, Roman city. Um, yes. And and you outlined how this process seems not to be visible in the transformation of the colonial city, which instead is 
designed following the same principles of the Roman yes. city, but its transformation in time follows a completely different pattern. And that is a very interesting point. I would like to uh, outline, uh, there are two main differences in, in these two processes. One is the, um, the time span. So the transformation of the colonial yes. city is something that has, I don't know, 200, three, in, in the case of Australia, 200, 300 years, barely. Yeah. Whereas the medieval transformation of the city happens across 1,000 years. 1,000 years. And that's one point. So the different time span is quite um, giving you a different yeah. perspective. But also that the, the classical city has gone through a very deep crisis. So the, most of those Roman cities were abandoned or partially abandoned and then repopulated in later times. So the transformation is not continuous. It's very much discontinuous, whereas colonial cities were not abandoned, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and the third point I wanted to outline is, is that not only there's a chronological difference, the difference in continuity and discontinuity, but there's a big difference in the strata. So the Roman city, let's take Bologna, for example, uh, Roman city and the Roman forum is four meters below the medieval city. Yeah. So there are four meters of soil between two, and this, yes. you know, an interlaying uh, layer of soil is what makes the, the difference. So the houses built in the Middle Ages were not built directly on top of those Roman houses and your tissue as well, but there's like one, it, there's a big layer in between that allows those variations in urban form. So yeah. typically the process of medievalization is referred to as those rectilinear streets that in the Middle Ages become curvilinear or they yeah. change the, their configuration. But, you know, it, it, it's not on the same level. Uh, it, there are four meters of difference. So, and then instead, the colonial city, the soil you're walking on in Perth is the same soil of the foundation. There is no difference in level. So the entrance of the buildings are at the same level. And yeah. therefore, it's quite, in a way, obvious that the um, deformation of the urban form does not occur in the um, transformation of the colonial city. But it would be interesting to take a look at what happened in some of those American cities that were flooded in the, in the past years, because the flooding process is layering some, you know, yes. uh, meters of mud on top of the... If there's any case in, in New Orleans, as an example, where this, you know, new layer of soil had changed in some instances, yes. the configuration of the urban grid. But I, 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 I believe it did not because they tend to clean up everything. You know? <laughs> well, that's that's the thing. I, I, I totally agree with you that there are differences, of course. And actually, it would be very dangerous to try to replicate a process that has taken a, a, a thousand years to develop in a particular way. But it is also true that certain phenomena can be traced back even in a reality that operates at, at, at a different speed, if you like. For instance, um, the, the abandonment uh, phenomena is not as massive as it happened in, during the medievalization, but it's impressive how certain areas becomes, become abandoned very quickly due to local and general uh, uh, economic uh, phenomena. And so you happen to have holes in the city, in a city that should be super compact like the city center of Perth, holes which are absolutely underutilized, uh, not used, uh, you have empty buildings, you have abandoned buildings, uh, you know, there's been a huge drop due to um, the financial crisis at the end of the, at the end of the mining boom, the, la the last mining boom in 2005, in 2010-12, there's been a huge drop um, of, uh, of rental in, 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 uh, in offices and, uh, in, in, to an extent in apartments in the city center, so the cities now actually tend to uh, you know, be abandoned and repopulated quite faster. But sometimes this doesn't happen just because of the, the market loads. There are some structural uh, issues that actually prevent the city from being reused quite easily. 
So this idea that uh, office buildings uh, probably should be considered easily transformable into, into housing is now taking place, and, and it, is, it is certainly a, a design process is, is driven by major powers, but it is a change of mindset in the way you effectively uh, approach the city as a dynamic form. Uh, probably what did not occur in, in colonial, in many colonial politics, that due to the lack of, 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 of a long history, this process of, that you have explained that happened during the medievalization is not there as such or is not as evident, you know. Uh, and so this was not considered a factor to, uh, that, that, is, that is part of, of our, of our um, process of making the cities. So in, in other words, the modernist city was built according to a particular prediction, but it was there to last for forever in a sense, uh, based on a simple model of continuous expansions and growth is the model of uh, you know unlimited development. Um, so it was a very linear pathway that has been set for a number of these of these uh, of these cities. I think that the lack of awareness that the, the city processes actually operate that way uh, has generated this problem. Is is not that is was not there. Is the lack of awareness in shaping contemporary city and to an extent even in shaping today's city. We have to be mindful that this is one of the layers of the city of the future. And even the artificial land that has been reclaimed, which is a totally artificial strata, uh, is part of that discourse and should be somehow reconnected in that discourse. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any question from the audience? Actually, uh, it's Ozia. It was very interesting for me to see who is talking about Pierre Bourdieu and Kanijia in the same presentation. Thank you. For that. <laughs> I'm still trying to understand the terms that they are using. Uh, sorry, sorry, Ozia. You would like to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Ozgo and I am uh, a PhD student in Ozian University and working as the teaching assistant in the same school. Yeah, nice to meet you. Okay. Thank you. Um, you would like me to comment further? Well, look, um, what we have found is that what struck me is that uh, Kanich and MFA effectively, uh, in their discourse, they don't make just the formalist discourse, but it's fully embedded with the culture that has generated a particular way of producing the city. Um, this is an approach that even Aldo Rossi has. Rossi has been considered close to Kanich and MFA, uh, particularly by the North American school. I don't know if this is more of a misreading of Rossi or there are some similarities that in the big picture still emerges. But what, what really struck me was the fact that uh, many authors, particularly from the Italian school of technology, have outlined the fact that there is a sort of, um, um, say there is a, an anthropological link between the way the city is built and the shape and the form that it takes. So typologies are expression of the culture. Uh, denying uh, or just not paying attention to this aspect and imagining that the, the, the city can be built, particularly the city centers, but not just those, uh, through uh, a model that doesn't take into account the strong relationship between the anthropological uh, uh, milieu and, 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 and so its culture of, of living and the notion of cultural capital, that's where it comes in. Um, you know, the, the connection between the, 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 the culture of living and the shape that this takes as an expression of that, uh, but just is purely expression of, you know, financial stability or wealthiness or, 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 or power, if you like. Um, I think that this is what has driven us to look at both you, uh, who has said this um, triple uh, definition of value, um, including culture. Uh, in the equation. So that's where we are at the moment. Uh, <laughs> um, probably uh, we need to, um, to to discuss this further. But for us, it's a way to introduce the, the, the cultural value as part of the equation in the contemporary city, the cultural value. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Any other question from the audience? Uh, 
Alessandro, Sir Alessandro, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for your presentation. It was really great. I'm Ömer Izgör thank from you. Mersin, Turkey, uh, which is uh, we graduate from uh, GAU. Uh, my uh, great uh, uh, professor Alexandru comes. I want to especially thank thank him for uh, this chance to listen to you. It's really good best, uh, chance for me. I want to ask you actually. Uh, uh, fast growth brought uh, urban problems, industrial area area with uh, dangers to health and safety. That's you know, the fast quickly expanding in industrial cities uh, cause water pollution, com community safe yes. disease, yes. in the social area, historical all hum humanity value. The under pressure of wild industrial area, white capitalism, which has destroyed all our humanity, human being values that include experience. What's our response? What's our response responsibility? I mean, designer, city planner, architect. Uh, what's our uh, responsibility for the future? What can we do? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. The, the... The audio was, was, was a little bit broken, but I think I got your question. So feel free to interrupt me if I'm not addressing uh, the answer. Also, the answer is quite, prob well, the problem you pose is quite large. So you will excuse me if I don't have a, a solution for that. But I, I can tell you what, what, I, what my position is. But also, let me uh, um, share your, your, your kind uh, words with, with my colleague Tanya, because uh, um, I have been working closely with her on this, and so she has contributed equally, particularly from the producer side, um, um, to this to this initial stage of of the research. Coming to your question, I think that uh, one of one big lesson that comes from uh, uh, for us as architects and how we can contribute, or planners or designers, how we can contribute to the problem that you mentioned. The big lesson is that. For me, the key word is wholeness. So understanding what we do in a holistic sense is a recovery of a humanist approach, uh, more generalist um, in, in designing and in, in managing our cities. Uh, most of the big projects that we have seen here in Perth are actually, I didn't mention the stadium, but uh, the stadium is another huge operation, quite successful so far. It has involved a lot of land recovery and cleaning most of the operations that are taking now place in Perth are actually trying to um, fix some disasters that have been caused by the proliferation of industrial cities, uh, which has considered the outskirts uh, uh, as, as a natural dump, uh, because that was the easy way, according to a model of, of unlimited development. I think that the change of mind and, and I think that this crisis that came now probably has been, uh, if, if anything, has brought an opportunity for reflection on how the world can or might function without having in mind, uh, you know, a full push on on, on consumption only, uh, and perhaps thinking more more smartly, uh, cleverly about our cities and how they develop a, a balance, a, a balanced vision between the the natural features and the artificial infrastructures and, and in the way in which we live in them probably can help us to shape a model that is not exactly um, the one that we are experiencing now. Um, of course, the, you know, maintaining the resources for, for future use is, is a pivotal point in, uh, in defining the model for sustainability. So our development must take that into account. And again, prior to the apparently unlimited availability of energy, uh, and wealthiness that the Industrial Revolution provided us, the way cities have developed was actually taking very, very much into account this. Of course, as Alessandro has mentioned, prices have been there in history, uh, you know, we might say almost periodically. But this is part of a, a, a larger uh, ec ecosystemic uh, kind of uh, understanding of how our, uh, our system operates. So I don't have answers in particular, but certainly uh, a, a, a bit of a change of mind and a, more fo a, a much more focus on, on, on elements and values that apparently 
can be easily quantified in financial value only, acknowledging that there are other values that cannot be monetized that easily. So that could expand um, our vision and give us a better sense of how to build more balanced systems for our urban and rural inhabitation of this planet. So I'm, I'm sorry if the if the if the if the answer is really too too wide, but I think that at the at the core of the problem is uh, is a better understanding of what is really valuable to all of us, um, for us and for and for next generation's future, um, and that goes through a rethinking of what is considered economically viable and what is important as uh, as financial viability. Uh, when we manage the cities. Just to give you an example, the city of Perth has accepted the, the Perth Convention Center, has accepted the, the Perth Arena, and the Perth Arena worked well, and, and the Perth Convention Center has been working okay for a number of years, but they did never consider how this could uh, leverage or could be uh, a green lung for, for the city along the river. They never consider how this could uh, support uh, better the local economy. Um, the operation was seen with, through big numbers, big TUs, and big operations. Uh, they are now reconsidering, uh, you know, the the Perth Convention Center place site uh, from a different perspective. So again, you know, um, if if you if you if you do these kind of mistakes from later, you pay for them. Question is, that is not you, but maybe in two or three generations, someone else is going to pay that price. So that's a big problem. Okay, okay sir. thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, everyone. We have uh, somebody from Brazil, Leticia von Kruger Pimentel. You want to say something? Welcome, first of all. Bienvenida, no, español. My, uh -huh. No hablo portugués. Uh, it's bienvenida. <laughs> bienvenida. Uh, thank you, Professor Alessandro. Um, Actually, um, uh, I'm here um, uh, very um, happy to see that uh, those situations that was presented by Professor Francesco are very similar to the ones uh, that I am uh, uh, studying in my PhD students, in my PhD students. Uh, we have in Brazil the same, uh, the same situations actually. Uh, and I am an architect, a conservation architect. So I'm <laughs> just uh, debating uh, this, um, this holiness that you say, this holiness uh, in the city. But from the point, from my point, uh, from the conservation point of view. And uh, I've been thinking uh, while you were presenting, if you think you, uh, Francesco and you, Alessandro, think that it is possible to have some parameters to make this sewing of um, those fragments of the city. Well, that, that's a very interesting topic and argument. Tanya and I are working on a paper now that is called Fragment Field and Frame, which refers exactly to this reality. Um, apparently, if you look at the city of Perth, just to be um, very, very uh, um, on, on the topic, um, there's, uh, most of the heritage buildings or the previous buildings are being demolished uh, in the outskirts and in the city center. But if you map them carefully, there is an incredible network of fragments that are still there in some form and could really be a, a network of anchor points to reconstitute uh, an urban network very much porous and continuous, particularly at the ground floor of the city without preventing the city uh, from developing in height. Uh, and definitely, I'm persuaded that um, uh, enabling the use, of course, from our school, um, uh, from Brandi to Carbonara in Italy, um, the, the, the notion of using heritage is the first form of, of preservation. Using the buildings is the best and the most important uh, rule you want to follow if you want to keep heritage building going. Um, and the other bit for me is really not preventing them from being part of the city. This comes at the risk or at the higher cost of management of a particular heritage precinct. 
But uh, we have noticed definitely in Perth there is a clear case. There are some heritage precincts which have been open to public in a much more open way. Uh, and they probably will be much more successful in the long term run than those that have been just preserved and, and open to public just to visit them as monuments of themselves. So I think that we need to be brave and consider in, in you know, sometimes it's very difficult, particularly when you have a you know, 1,000 uh, years old uh, piece of history that is down there, you know, and, and the, the maintenance or, or, the, or, or, or the preservation of the artifact as such, you know, when the plaster can come down very easily, you have to be very careful. But whenever it's possible, as much as you can, uh, and even through in, in interventions, contemporary inter interventions, allow that particular piece to to become and you know the city of rome is is is, is an incredible example of, of good uh, of good opportunities that sometimes have been uh, used in in the best way um perhaps without giving too much space to integration between contemporary architecture and the past but it, again if we go back to the past and we look at what happened to major moments in the past they were always integrated by the most advanced technological means if if a transformation needed to occur. So again, uh, um, we know that the sensibility that we have today is coming from an eight, the 18th century uh, discovery of, of the archaeology in the past and, and, and the passion from for, 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 for heritage in a way. Um, that has gone through a long process of evolution over the past 250 years. Yes. Uh, the, I think that the most difficult part is that you can have a discourse at a, a large scale, but then it's really on a case by case that you need to make decisions. And that's where it becomes very difficult to establish criteria. But I would say that use and open to publicness and cultural awareness through programs that enable people to understand better why and how do we spend much money to make these places available. Uh, are the three bits. Now, uh, where to compensate all the efforts for doing this? Uh, I think that uh, there are some hidden values that uh, emerge in terms of livability and in terms of uh, uh, belong, sense of belonging to place. It could be measured in many other forms. I'm a strong advocate of this. Uh, and perhaps big data might help us understanding if and how health in the city or safety in the city might be improved by a better quality of the of the of the built environment that also goes through a valorization of heritage and um if, if you allow me to extend my question uh, what about uh, sure. what about form parameters do you think it is okay. possible well to have yes Ha, this is a very controversial case. The example that we shown uh, is actually against probably anything had been studied so far in my studies at uni. So I'm just going through the slides to get back to the treasury building. <laughs> um, but I have to say in, in full honesty that when I was presented to this particular way, and you know, most of the debate actually that uh, occurred in the 70s and in the 80s, we did a bit of research and there was a, a research report about where to place the tower building with the offices. Everyone was starting from the assumption that the tower office should not touch the main heritage building that was on the left side of this of this block. And effectively, we ended up with a solution that, you know, bravely put the tower in there, suspending the tower at the ground floor. I have to say that the courtyard has been quite so the courtyard building is not fully uh it is visible if you walk through but uh the sense of the courtyard building has been a little bit sacrificed but i have to say that you know compared to the principles that i have in terms of preservation sorry my bad sorry my bad you open too many applications. Alexander. No, my computer, my computer is, is freezing, so I'm standing on another computer. Otherwise, I'm going to lose. Oh, all right, okay, sorry. My bigger um, for this. So I was saying, you know, the principle of preservation of forms. You cannot go higher than the heritage building. You need to use materials which are very similar to the ones at the heritage building. Mm. Typologically speaking, you need to be, you need to resonate with what's next to you or where you are doing an intervention. All of these, and you know, if we go back to um, this image here, uh, actually, 
the um, the side of the of the of the treasury building, which is what you see here on the left side of the of the round library, is an extension done by George Temple Paul, the architect of third of the original building, which in fact was transformed. And I go back to to this image here. Um, this building here, the, the treasury building, was transformed into a, a French style uh, building in in 1900s. So all of these attention that we have, that things have to be in strong uh, symphony uh, with the pre-existing building, needs to be discussed on a case by case, really, uh, and see if this is just rules we need to apply, or, or uh, you know, just points of reflection um, and discuss an a, a, a possible solution on a on, on a on a case by case. And these images, you see that the building that is. You know the, the tower that is there is really among us, but from the street view, uh, from the street perspective, and the use of the ground floor and the use of this building as it works, and it does not interfere. So actually, locating the same amount of space that actually is paying for all of this is paying for the restoration and the preservation of the original building. Um, if we had to spread all of this amount of money invested in built environment elsewhere, probably we would have saturated spaces that actually is worth to leave uh, available for the city to function and to gather people there. So it's a very challenging uh, decision, but actually, you know, and I'm coming from a culture where this would be seen as an horrendous. <laughs> Uh, uh, intervention, but I must say that all in all, I agree with what has been done. Uh, you know, um, and Tanya can 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 actually argue with me if she wants, or she can back me up. Uh, but we we discussed about this, and I think that you know, at the end, uh, if the result, uh, you know, simulation of the result is also a very big, a very very important thing. But in a way, uh, this resonates also with the process that happened there. A city three story high has transformed itself in a, in a, in a 30 story high city. And to an extent, this is actually just showing what has happened in, in the blocks uh, next to this one. Um, it's not that different from what happened there. So instead of preserving just the facades, right, uh, and, and have a huge city uh, tower that is there, and there are a number of examples where you see just these fragments which preserve the facades for the street view, but they don't make any sense because behind in, in the internal space is not is not shared with the city. Uh, I think that you know uh, this is a um, this is part of, is a positive outcome for this particular case. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I had to change the computer. Uh, we have somebody from Erbil, Iraq. Shad, are you there? You want to say, you want to comment? No, sir. Uh, it is uh, just like a great presentation. Thank you for you. Okay. Any, anyone else? <clears throat> Any other uh, comment from the audience? Okay, so if there's no other comment, I would like to uh, interrupt the recording uh, after thanking Francesco Mancini for his Thank lecture. You. And um, 